Yeah, well, you have to remember that at the time, we didn't have any evidence that the universe was expanding, right? So what Einstein did originally in 1917 was to force the universe to be static because we didn't know anything about the universe beyond the extent of the Milky Way galaxy. Join us on a huge cosmology problem just disappeared. Webb's deep field image with flamingo shatters our physics. In cosmology, we've had the Hubble tension that has attracted a lot of attention in the past decade. It might have just disappeared, even though we have built our cosmological model based on observations, theories, and mathematics supporting those theories. There are a few clues that the universe isn't completely adding up. You may have heard about the crisis in cosmology. Well, the crisis originated when different methods of measuring the age of the universe started giving different results, and they still do. Cosmologists have no idea why. The James Webb Telescope, with its recent images, has worsened the crisis even more. But for now, here's a very quick refresher. The universe is expanding, and distant galaxies are moving farther away from us. The age of the universe is one of the most fascinating questions that humanity has ever asked. Through a range of measurements and observations, scientists have determined that the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old. This age estimate is closely related to the so-called Hubble constant, which measures the current expansion rate of the universe. A higher Hubble constant means the universe expands faster and is therefore younger, while a more slowly expanding universe is older. However, these methods produce different values for the Hubble constant, leading to the Hubble tension and the cosmological crisis. Well, for old-timers, it's hard to call it a crisis. It is a crisis, but for old-timers like me, it's really hard. I come from an era, an epoch, where we didn't know the age or the size of the universe because they're related to within a factor of two. Is the universe 10 billion years old, or is it 20 billion years old? And if you put all the data together, people sort of picked and chose and sifted. There was the 10 billion year camp and the 20 billion year camp, and they were warring factions for many years. This is how you get this divide. It's on the frontier and eventually, with better telescopes and better data, this is how it's always solved. So with this factor of two warring factions, new data, especially with the Hubble telescope and the observations of the cosmic microwave background, and three satellites that were engaged in this, each successively more precise than the last, it turned out the uncertainty was no longer a factor of two. It narrowed. It narrowed. And of course, the actual answer ended up somewhere in between. So we're now at about 14 billion years. No one is saying 10 or 20 anymore. You'd expect that if the two warring factions were right, the answer would probably be somewhere in between, as it turned out to be. So we're all happy with a 14 billion year old universe. But then people started looking more carefully at it. They used this method and that method and our observations are so precise. The Hubble constant version of the age of the universe is at 50 or 100. That gets you these two different ages of the universe. If the Hubble constant is 50, then the age of the universe is 20 billion years. If the Hubble constant is 100, then the age of the universe is 10 billion years. But the point is, those two numbers, which used to have a huge uncertainty, no longer have a huge uncertainty. But now, each has its own camp, because the uncertainty in each number excludes the other number. If you put the uncertainties around those two numbers, the uncertainties don't overlap. Had those two numbers had uncertainties that overlapped, then it's just a matter of time before you get some better data. So that's a crisis in cosmology. One way scientists measure the Hubble constant is by studying the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the leftover radiation from the Big Bang. Light doesn't travel particularly fast over cosmological distances, 186,000 miles a second. That means that as you look out to even nearby objects, let's say the closest object you can see with the naked eye, the Andromeda galaxy, if you look at that, about 2 million light years away, it means you see it as it was 2 million years in the past. You look at more distant galaxies, 10 million light years away, 10 million years in the past, and so on. So you could ask the question, 
Well, in that case, are there objects that are so distant that the light traveling from them began its journey close to the Big Bang itself? Is that possible? And the answer is yes. That light was first detected in the 1960s. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, CMB. The CMB is believed to be nearly uniform in all directions with small fluctuations that can be measured and used to determine the Hubble constant. There is also a different method astronomers use to measure relative distances in the universe. This is known as the Cosmic Distance Ladder. It relies on using different types of objects as rungs on a ladder, with each rung providing a way to measure distances to more distant objects. The first rung on the cosmic distance ladder is the measurement of distances to nearby stars using the technique of parallax. This involves measuring the apparent shift in the position of a star against the background of more distant stars as the Earth orbits the Sun. By measuring the angle of this shift, astronomers can calculate the distance to the star. The next rung on the cosmic distance ladder is the measurement of distances to nearby galaxies using a type of variable star known as the Cepheid variable. Cepheids have a well-known relationship between their intrinsic brightness and their period of variation, which allows astronomers to determine their distance based on their observed brightness. Further up the cosmic distance ladder are other types of variable stars, such as supernovae, which can be used to measure distances to galaxies at even greater distances. Using these different rungs on the cosmic distance ladder, astronomers are able to measure distances to objects throughout the universe and build a more complete picture of its structure and evolution over time. Resolving this tension is one of the most pressing questions in modern cosmology and may require new and innovative approaches to measuring the universe's expansion. This discrepancy could be an indication that there is another ingredient in the universe that has not yet been observed. One promising candidate for this additional ingredient is known as early dark energy. The idea behind early dark energy is that the universe went through a phase early in its history when dark energy had a higher energy density than it does today. This would have affected the expansion rate of the universe, making it faster during that early period. As the universe expanded and cooled, the energy density of that early dark energy would have decreased and its effects on the expansion rate would have diminished. This could potentially solve the cosmological crisis and reconcile the different measurements of the Hubble constant since the higher expansion rate during the early dark energy period would result in a higher value of the Hubble constant at that time, which would then decrease to the current measured value as the early dark energy density decreased. While early dark energy is a promising idea, it is still a relatively new and untested hypothesis. Researchers at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics have now narrowed down the properties of this new type of energy using a complementary statistical method known as the profile likelihood, which is common in particle physics, but rarely used in cosmology. More research is needed to determine if early dark energy can fully resolve the Hubble tension. To unravel this mystery, astronomers turn to one of the world's most powerful supercomputers for the largest ever cosmological simulations. The magnitude of this project becomes apparent when considering that the simulations demanded over 50 million hours of computer time distributed across 30,000 processors comprising the supercomputer at Durham University in the UK. Dubbed Flamingo, the project, with its convoluted acronym denoting full hydro large-scale structure simulations with all-sky mapping for the interpretation of next-generation observations, stands out not only for its immense size and high resolution, but also for its comprehensive approach. Distinct from previous simulations primarily focused on modeling dark matter, Flamingo goes beyond gravity alone. While dark matter constitutes the majority of mass in the universe, ordinary baryonic matter, despite comprising only a fifth of the total mass, significantly influences how cosmic matter is distributed at smaller scales. Factors such as galactic winds propelled by supermassive black holes and supernova explosions can impede galaxy growth. Unlike earlier simulations that exclusively considered dark matter, Flamingo incorporates and tracks ordinary matter, recognizing that even though dark matter dominates gravity, the role of ordinary matter 
cannot be disregarded. Despite notable advancements, such as accurately depicting the formation of celestial bodies like the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies, Flamingo falls short of explaining the observed weak clumping of matter in the current day universe. In other words, it failed to resolve the very thing it was created to help solve, the S8 tension. Or might I say that the Flamingo simulations indicate that something is terribly wrong with our cherished standard model of cosmology? The simulation also contradicts the observations of the James Webb Space Telescope and other observatories regarding the distribution of matter in the universe. The current theory beautifully explains how galaxies evolved, but there's a problem. It predicts that they're 7% more closely clustered together than they actually are. The new computer simulation is much more detailed and takes into account the role of supermassive black holes. But that's not right either it's still 5% more clumpy.